Thank you, Maggie. Good morning. How are you this morning? All right, peachy, good, okay, good. It's good to see you. I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see the announcements that we have listed in the worship folder this morning. Uh, this is this coming week is our week for secondhand rows. Uh, and I know because of people being gone for annual conference, there are gonna be some changes at the schedule. If you need to make any kind of schedule adjustments, uh, check in with uh, Patty Stauffer, but do that soon uh, because she'll be leaving in a couple of days for annual conference. Uh, conference runs this year uh, July 3rd through the 7th. Uh, it's gonna be Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, the pre-conference meeting Meetings start on, um, uh, uh, for me, they start on uh, the second, uh, so I'll be leaving uh, tomorrow. I'll be driving up to Grand Rapids tomorrow to begin my meetings on the second, uh, and then conference through the rest of the week in Grand Rapids. Looking ahead to the 17th, 18th, and 19th Bible School uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. I know we uh, re we were planning to have, I, I don't know if we're still planning to have it or not, a meeting today for people who, okay, we are. I see a thumbs up back there. So those of you who are going to be helping out with Bible School or who may be interested in helping out with Bible School, um, uh, around 11 o'clock after you've had a chance to get some refreshments we'll have a we'll have a meeting you can check in with Courtney about that uh, also uh, looking ahead to July the 20th the uh, leadership team will be meeting Saturday morning uh, that'll be at 10 o'clock here at the church after the week after annual conference I'm gonna go ahead and take a week of vacation that week so I will not be here the next two Sundays uh, I invite you especially to come next Sunday uh, to hear our guest speaker uh, his name is Brian Brooks uh, and he is an ordained minister, and he is also the director of the uh, Village of Progress in Oregon. Uh, when we're in Oregon, I enjoy uh, stopping in at the village, uh, the village bakery there, and getting some baked goods or some coffee or something. Where uh, some of the uh, some of the folks who are a part of the Village of Progress work. It's a wonderful ministry. Uh, we appreciate them very much, and I encourage people to to come and hear Brian speak. I look forward to uh, being able to watch. Uh, hopefully we'll have a, a tape of whatever message he brings. I look forward to being able to see that. Uh, so that'll be next Sunday. Um, also, you can see that uh, Trisha Crumley is gonna be in the office for Patty on Thursday, July the 11th. So if you have any information for the bulletin, uh, you can send it to the church email. That's polocob3 at gmail.com, polocob3 at gmail.com or you can call Tricia or uh, give her a copy and she'll be glad to see that that gets taken care of. Uh, I think that's all that I have for announcements. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements or business type things? Yes, Courtney. Hello, um, as Pastor said, yes, we will be having a Vacation Bible School meeting today. Um, it's for anybody who's already talked to me or anyone who might be interested in helping with Vacation Bible School. Um, this is different than we've done in years past, and so we need many hands on deck. There's lots of different places where you could be used, um, so please come and talk to me. Come to the meeting today at 11 if that's something you're interested in. And then I also wanted to let you know that we will be collecting hamburger helper, rice aroni, and instant mashed potatoes for the food pantry this month. Thank you. Hamburger helper, rice aroni, and instant mashed potatoes. I dropped off some soup yesterday. I don't know what our final count was on soup. I know our goal was 100. We made over 100 cans of soup, so we did hit our goal. Thank you for all of you who helped with that, uh, and thank you for the folks who work with the Lifeline Food Pantry. We're glad for their ministry. Are there others? If not, then uh, please join me in the call to worship. That's uh, from Psalm 30, verses 1 through 5. It's here in your worship folder. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me. Uh, I'm going to say, we, we are starting, okay? All of us are starting together. This is kind of, usually I start, so I get it. Okay. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let mine enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. 
for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Our hymn is, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. It's 279 if you'd like the words in the hymnal, but we'll have the words on the screen. You're welcome to stand. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, we have a few uh, joys and a few concerns uh, to share this morning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Church of the Brethren Annual Conference is coming up this week. For those of you not familiar with it, Annual Conference is a gathering of, uh, of ministers and lay people uh, elected as representatives or delegates from their congregations, meets once a year, hence the name Annual Conference, and makes decisions uh, about programs and policy and polity for the denomination. Uh, along along with uh, a lot of excellent worship services. Uh, those of you who were at uh, Jonathan and Courtney's wedding, for instance, one of the, uh, you may remember the soloist who was at that wedding. Um, uh, he, uh, his name is escaping me right now. Pardon me? Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, was, I was about to say Brandon Hyde, but he's the manager of the Baltimore Orioles. You can, t <laughs> you can tell where I used to live. So Brandon Grady, who is the soloist, uh, he, uh, he's gonna be one of the speakers uh, for evening worship at conference. So we're looking forward to that. The uh, theme of conference this year comes from Romans 16 verses two, welcome and worthy. And you can see the different people listed who have specific and major responsibilities. For annual conference, there is a director. Uh, it's a full-time position, making all the different arrangements, hotel and uh, venue negotiations. Her name is Rhonda Pittman Gingrich. Uh, the moderator elect, the woman who will be the moderator next year, uh, and conducting the conference is Deva Hensley. Uh, and the moderator this year is from the Illinois Wisconsin district. She grew up in the uh, Springfield uh, First Church congregation. Her name is Madeline Metzger. Uh, and I am looking forward to conference, uh, looking forward to getting to see some friends that I don't get to see all that often, getting to catch up with people, getting to see Grand Rapids once again. Grand Rapids is a nice town and we enjoy it very, very much. Uh, we also uh, have a few other things uh, that we can be in prayer about oh, and uh, in thanksgiving for. Visited with Eileen Kinney this past week. She's doing well, uh, feeling good. Uh, says the food at uh, Heritage Square is much better than it was at Morningside. So that's a good thing, because uh, uh, when, as, as all of you know, how, how good the food is in a particular place makes a big difference in how you perceive the place. So we're glad that she's doing well. We continue in prayer for her, uh, for Pam Lindsley, uh, for Dwayne and Carol uh, Milhorn. I spoke with Dwayne this past, uh, actually I just talked to him yesterday. Uh, he's been up and down, continuing to try to deal with nerve pain and uh, nerve problems, uh, particularly in his back. He was hoping that they would be able to be here this morning, uh, but they are not, which means he's probably not feeling all that good this morning. It's not a not a matter of anything life-threatening or anything like that, but just, just very 
uncomfortable, a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort that comes and goes and is hard to predict. So we're in prayer for them. We continue in prayer for Tom Nelson. Talked with Tom this past week and he's feeling much better, uh, is out a little bit, although he said he's probably gonna stay stay, uh, stay in most of the time for the next couple of weeks yet. Although staying in for Tom, I think, doesn't really mean staying in the way it might for the rest of us. I think staying in for Tom means he's not gonna take a cross country trip in the next couple of weeks. But he is doing better and we're glad for that. Continue in prayer for Bill and for Betty Hare, uh, for Bev's son, Scott. Uh, how's he doing? Is he continuing to recover? Yes, he's doing well, thank you. Good. We are thankful and we are glad to hear that he is doing well and, and recovering. Thank you and we continue in prayer for him. Uh, we already mentioned earlier the Ministry of the Village of Progress in Oregon and their director, Brian Brooks, uh, and the uh, Lifeline Food Pantry. Uh, what else do we have to share that we're thankful for uh, or things that we need to lift up as concerns? Yes, Julia, just, just a moment. You must wait. You, we, we, we may need to adjust our polity so that people are required to wait for the microphone. So. Um, it's just, it's Jeff and my joy this morning that Diane is with us. And uh, Diane and Jeff got together at the very first play he was in. And, and now that we have a huge friend. So thanks. It's good to see you, Diane. I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Are there others? It's nice, it's cooler. Yes, yes. You, I won't make you walk all the way up. Maggie is glad that it's cooler. And I am too. I am too. It's nice this morning. Are there others? We have a uh, video song this morning that uh, Catherine said she might come up and help us sing this. You want to come on up, Catherine? Come on up. Come on up. This is a song that, uh, that Catherine and the other girls uh, led us in after Bible school. Uh, and most of you probably know it. Uh, you're welcome to sing along. I don't know how, you know, I, different people know different, uh, different motions and stuff like that. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm gonna go over and join Catherine and we're gonna sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. All right, you ready? All right, we're ready. The joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed reading way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed reading way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart to stay. My love so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. have been able to tell since she was facing away, but Catherine was singing most of the time uh, and did very, very well. Good job, Catherine. All right. All right. Let's pray. God, we do have joy in our hearts. Uh, we do 
if we don't have joy in our hearts, we seek joy in our hearts. We seek peace in our hearts. We, we seek faith in our hearts. We know those things are there, God. We don't always feel them. We don't always know them. Sometimes we know them in our heads, but we know it in our heads, but not in our hearts. Help us to feel joy and peace and love within our hearts. Help us to know that you are in our hearts. We pray that, God, not just for ourselves, but for everybody, that, that everybody will know your spirit's guidance and your spirit's presence within. We pray for the annual conference and the, the people who serve the annual conference. We mentioned uh, Rhonda and uh, Deva and Madeline, but there are so many more people who make conferences like that work and succeed. Uh, so many more delegates, uh, Martin from our own congregation and others who, who need wisdom and need guidance in making decisions for the, the, the future of our denomination. We pray for all of them. We pray for everyone who's traveling. We pray for the folks in Grand Rapids who are hosting. Uh, we pray for employees at, at restaurants and hotels and, and all those sorts of different things. All, these, all those things... <clears throat> All those things, God, and all those people that are sometimes invisible to us, um, we pray for all of them. And we pray that they will know your presence and that we as a denomination and as individuals will be blessings to them. Uh, we pray for the ministry of the Lifeline Food Pantry, the ministry of the Village of Progress and their director, uh, Brian Brooks, and the other people who work there and the residents and clients there. We pray for each of them. We pray for Bill and for Betty Hare, for Tom Nelson, for Carol, for Dwayne Milhorn. We pray for Pam Lindsley, for Eileen Kinney. We pray for Bev's son, Scott. We can pray for his continued recovery. We're thankful, God, for a, a cool and comfortable morning. Uh, we know there are places where the, where the weather may not be cool or comfortable this morning where the weather may be hot, or in other places where it's a different season now where the weather may be too cold. We pray for each of those places and each of those people. We pray for those who have needs that we know about and those who have needs we don't know about. We rejoice with good things that happen here and around the world. Some of them we are aware of, most of them we are not. That's true even within our own lives, God. We have so many blessings that we are not always aware of them, so many that we cannot be aware of all of them. You are aware of them. You are aware of our needs. You are aware of our hopes, our fears, our wounds, our sins, our, our weaknesses. We lift all of those up to you, God asking you to remove them from our hearts and asking that you will help us to live in the knowledge of forgiveness, grace, salvation, and joy in our hearts. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now share with one another, uh, as we've already shared joys and concerns, we'll share now out of our uh, financial gifts and offerings. God has given us so many things uh, and we have an opportunity now to return a portion of that uh, to God uh, for the ministry of the Spirit uh, and the sharing of the kingdom through this congregation, through this denomination, and in our community and around the world. Uh, the ushers will receive your tithes and your offerings as we sing number 311, The Church's One Foundation.
Let's pray. God, thank you for these gifts, and thank you for each person who shares their gifts for the glory of, of your kingdom. Help us to know the gifts that we have. Help us to know the ways and the opportunities that we have to use them, uh, both, both for your glory and for the good of our neighbor. And help us to dedicate our lives, every part of our lives, to doing what it is that you call us to do. All of these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Mark 5, uh, verses 21 through 43. The service is moving very quickly this morning. I could, I could probably I could write an extra sermon or something or have, have Julia go print off an extra one real quick. But. This is moving very quickly, so you must want a lot of coffee this morning. That's all I can say. Mark 5, uh, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. And then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and, and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed and, and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and, and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. Oh, but they laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And he told them to give her something to eat. Uh, how many of you have uh, had to go to the emergency room at one time or another for treatment on your own, not, uh, not taken by an ambulance? How many of you have done that? A few, a few. Those of you who did, how many of you got in for treatment right away? As opposed to, you know, have, I mean, and it, I know it always takes a minute to go through the intake process, but how many of you got in for treatment immediately as opposed to having to wait a while? I've had both experiences going to the ER. When I was a pastor in Dayton, I wasn't feeling well, uh, and I was having some chest pains. 
And so Julia uh, drove me to the uh, emergency room. And when I told them I was having chest pains, we hadn't even finished check-in. They took my name, my date of birth. Uh, and I think before they asked me for my insurance, they said what was going on. I said I was having chest pains. They took me right there, right then. Julia presumably had to finish the rest of the, the paperwork at some point later on. The last time I went to the emergency room on my own as a patient, I was having a lot of pain from a kidney stone. Uh, I had gone to my uh, primary care physician. Uh, she gave me a shot for the pain. She sent me on to the emergency room. Uh, and once I got there, I told them what was going on. And we waited. And we waited. And we waited. I wasn't, I wasn't doubled over in pain anymore. The shot had kicked in. But it still hurt a lot. It hurt a lot. But since it was only a kidney stone, as opposed to, you know, chest pains or, or a, a, a traumatic, you know, a motor vehicle accident or something like that. I had to wait, you know, 45 minutes or so in the waiting room until I could get in to actually see the, see the doctor. I've also had one experience that was kind of halfway in between those where I had, I, I was having a nosebleed. Sometimes in the winter I get nosebleeds uh, and it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop. I was at work. Uh, I w went over to the um, uh, to the uh, fire dispatch uh, area because there's a, uh, a fire officer over there, a captain for the fire de fire and rescue department, who's also trained as an EMT. And it was I know it's just a nosebleed, but I said yes, nosebleed's not stopping. Any ideas? He gave me some ideas. I went into a separate room, you know, put my head down, my nose, did this, did that. You know, 15, 20 minutes still hadn't stopped. He said, you know what, we, you know what we're supposed to do, according to EMD, which is Emergency Medical Dispatch, ask you a bunch of questions to decide what kind of help to send you. Technically, what you have is uncontrolled bleeding. And technically, that means this is an advanced life support call, because you have uncontrolled bleeding. I said, you don't need, you don't need to make this an ALS call. And he said, well, because this is technically uncontrolled bleeding, and because I now know about it, I need to call you an ambulance. And so, although it was just a nosebleed, and, and it was uncontrolled, except when I was like doing this, and that's all it was, ambulance came, picked me up, took me to the hospital. Because I came in by ambulance, I bypassed whoever was in the waiting room, maybe someone with terrible kidney, pain, kidney stones like I was, had had previously, I don't know, uh, and they waved me right in so that I could spend another half hour or an hour in one of the bays there in the hospital doing this to my nose. Ah, oh, that whole process, that whole process of sorting out the different people is called triage. Uh, wait, trying to figure out which problem is the most severe and which patient needs to be seen first. Any of you watch MASH on television years and years ago? You'll remember triage from MASH. That's what's going on here. Uh, this is from the TV show MASH, and you can tell that. You can tell it's from the TV show by that pole there in the center that has uh, all these different mileages to different places like San Francisco and, and all around the world. But the wounded people have come in on that bus. They're being carried out. You can see a guy on the right carrying someone on the stretcher. Uh, other doctors are, uh, there's, I think that's Harry Morgan, uh, 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 Colonel Potter there in the front and Hawkeye looking over a patient. That's Charles Emerson Winchester in the back looking over another patient. They're making an initial assessment they're doing triage to try to, to figure out who to treat first. Not only was the triage doctor in a MASH unit supposed to figure out who among the wounded soldiers was the most seriously injured and therefore who should go in for surgery first, there was another step. They were supposed to figure out who was so badly injured that surgery would be a waste of time and resources. If the effort and the skill and the time spent on one wounded soldier who was going to die anyway 
could be better spent saving two or three other lives. The triage doctor was supposed to make that decision and see that the other soldiers, although perhaps less seriously wounded, got in for surgery first. MASH was, of course, set in the Korean War. MASH units did not really change a lot uh, over the years from what they looked like then. This is the triage section of a MASH unit uh, from the Iraq War. Uh, and while I'm sure there's more technology, and it's not like a, a dirt floor kind of setting, but it, you know, it's essentially the same kind of setup as it was on the TV show. For those of you who watched the MASH TV show, MASH stands, I should say stood, for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. They have been phased out over the years. The last MASH unit uh, was closed down in 2006. The Army now uses what are called combat support hospitals. Anyway, Peter Woods, uh, a few years ago, used the image of triage uh, to write a blog post about this morning's gospel reading. But I, I hadn't thought about it this way, but I thought it was a, a, a good image. You've got two, two women, two women that Jesus has to deal with. One of them uh, is uh, Jairus' daughter, uh, and she's got a lot going for her. She's 12 years old. Uh, in our day, it means she's still a little girl, uh, and they called her little girl uh, when they're saying, yeah, my little girl is sick, my little girl is dying. Uh, but all of you, you know, if some of you may have uh, daughters who are 45 years old, they're still your little girl, right? Uh, so she's 12 years old. In that context, that means she's coming up on childbearing age. She's, she may get, be getting married in a couple of years. But she's got a lot going for her. She's young. She's part of a, a well-known family, important in the local synagogue, local community. She's got her whole life ahead of her, her whole future. She has the potential to have a lot of influence in one way or another over events in the future, the potential to, to bear children, to create life, to nurture little children and, and teach them about, about Jesus, about the rabbi who saved her life, to help bring them into a right relationship with Jesus Christ that was a very, very challenging thing for people in that day. And all of that doesn't even consider the kind of influence that Jairus has. I, I know Jesus told him not to say anything. And I'm sure that Jairus will do his best to obey, but he'll know, and his wife will know, and sooner or later, one of them will tell somebody. And that person will tell somebody else. And even if they don't tell somebody, the little girl knows. And sooner or later, maybe in a week, someone's going to say, you were so sick last week. What happened? Well, this guy came. She's going to tell somebody who will tell someone else. And word will get around. And it'll create a lot of good feelings for Jesus. This is like good, good PR for Jesus uh, in that community and in that region. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. She's been having this problem for as long as Jairus' daughter has been alive. We don't know her name. We don't know her family's name. We don't know if she had a family besides herself. She said she had, it says she had spent all of her money and all of her resources, which implies that she's alone in the world because it doesn't talk about her husband's money, her husband's resources. Women in that time would have had no resources or money aside from their husbands. So she probably does not have a husband as a widow. That's just a guess. Uh, and she may or may not have kids. Kids would have been responsible, male children particularly, would have been responsible to take care of her. So she may not have any kids. She may be entirely alone in the world. We know nothing about her, except that she had some money at one time that she has spent trying to deal with this problem. So she has limited resources. She has uh, limited power, limited influence 
in, in many ways, as far as we can tell at this moment in time, she has a fairly limited future. Now, if you and I are going to triage these two people based on what we know, who would we tell Jesus to treat and heal first? I don't think it's a close call. Most of us would tell Jesus to initially spend his time and his power and his resources on the girl, on Jairus' daughter. And then if he had time, Jesus could come back and heal the older woman later. But if we're being practical, if we're triaging, if we're making a decision about costs and benefits and all that kind of stuff, then, then the little girl, her life before her, her the daughter of an, an influential man, she should probably come first. Her situation is also more serious. It's life-threatening. This woman has been living with this problem for 12 years. I'm sure it's difficult for her. It may be painful for her, but it is not a life-threatening problem. Whereas whatever's going on for Jairus' daughter is life-threatening. The older woman may have been afraid of a result like that because she did not approach Jesus and ask for healing. Instead, she says to herself, Jesus doesn't even have to know I'm here. I, I, I don't want him to say no. I'll just, I'll just sneak up on him. I'll sneak up on him and I'll, I'll touch his cloak and I'll be healed. And that's what she did. And that's what happened. It's one of the reasons I really like this, this picture where she's just you see the stretching and the reaching, and she's had to, to crawl through this crowd of people walking around and walking by and, and perhaps even stepping over her. It shows her desperation. It shows how hard she had to work to get to Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus knew that someone had touched him. Jesus is God and is therefore omnipotent, and you... You can't really sneak up on God. You can't really sneak up on uh, Jesus. So Jesus says, who touched me? Again, Jesus probably knows who touched him. My parents used to ask, who broke this lamp? Who ate these cookies? And they knew perfectly well it was me. No matter how much I tried to blame my sister or blame the dog or blame Casper the friendly ghost, I don't know. It's probably the same kind of thing here. Jesus knows who touched him, but he wants the woman to own what she did. He wants her to accept, take responsibility for her actions. We usually think about taking responsibility for something as being willing to accept the, the punishment for. You, know, you need to take responsibility for whatever went wrong, like stealing the cookies or whatever. But here he wants her to take responsibility so that she can receive a more full blessing. But she doesn't know that yet. The woman fesses up that it was her. He listens to her story. He takes time spends time, so it's not just a matter of healing her and moving on, he spends time, he listens to her, he sees her as an individual. He probably learned her name in the converse, I know he's God and he knew, but the people listening to them probably heard her name, some of them maybe for the first time, probably heard how long she had been going through this problem, how long she'd had this, what she'd lost, what it had cost her, how she was isolated or ostracized because of this bleeding, she would have been considered unclean by the Jews of that day. And so she would have been ostracized or on the outside of the community. And she's telling him all of this. And in the meantime, people come to tell Jesus and Jairus that it's too late Jairus' daughter has died. The time that Jesus spent with this woman, asking who had touched him, when he knew probably perfectly well who had touched him, and then listening to her little story and telling her it was all okay, and she should be proud of her faith and all of that. The time that Jesus spent talking to this woman with no money, and at least until this moment, no future, 
may very well be what cost the little girl her life. Now, of course, we know that's not how the story goes. Jesus goes on to the house, takes Jairus and his wife in to see the dead girl, tells the dead girl to, to get up, and she gets up. It's a happy ending. It's a happy ending for everyone. There are a lot of lessons, and there are a lot of morals in this story. Every life is precious. Jesus is no respecter of the uh, social status or the wealth of people. That doesn't matter to Jesus. Faith makes a difference. Poor people are as worthy of good things as rich people. Those with relatively little future are as important as those with a long life ahead of them. Folks with no power, no influence matter just as much as folks with power and influence. I could go on, but there are, there are easily a, a dozen different lessons or morals uh, just at first glance without even getting deeper into the text. Here is one. Some people are invisible. It's obvious in our scripture reading who the invisible person was. Jairus was an important guy in the community. He's the leader of the synagogue. He's got family and friends waiting at his house, sitting with his daughter, comforting his wife. The crowd makes way for him to, to get to Jesus. The people at his house, they know where he is. They know how to find him in order to deliver, to deliver the news of his daughter's death. So Jairus is a big deal. Not so much the woman in the crowd. The woman in our gospel reading was, was pretty close to invisible. She was on the outside of the community because she was unclean. People were accustomed to her and to her problems. People probably no longer noticed her. We have people like that in our lives. We, we see people who are going through a difficult time, uh, but it's a long lasting kind of a difficult time. You know, it's a chronic thing and we, we just kind of take it for granted that that's who they are or that's what's going on with them. We, we sometimes, uh, uh, not so much here in, in Polo, but when I lived in DC, we would see people all the time on street corners looking for money. We would see homeless people all the time and eventually, they kind of just become invisible to you. It's, that's just that, that guy that camps out under the, under the interchange. The, the woman in our gospel reading was close to invisible. The little girl, we don't know her name, but we know who she is. She's Jairus' daughter. The older woman, She's somebody's daughter, but we don't know who. She might have been somebody's wife, somebody's mother. None of those names, not even her own name, are passed down to us. I mentioned DC has something like 11,000 people without permanent shelter. On any given night, there are about a thousand people sleeping on the streets. I did a little research to try to see what those numbers are for Polo or for Ogle County or, or some of the surrounding areas. I didn't really see anything that was like real, real local, but I know that there are homeless people in our communities. I know because we have had people uh, stop by at the church from time to time who are between homes. I know that there are temporary shelters in Dixon and in Sterling and in other places. And if, it's, if, if Sterling and Dixon and Polo and Oregon and all these places out here are like everywhere else that I've ever lived. There are more people who need those services than there is money to fund those services. There are more people who need a bed than there are who have beds. And the fact that there are people in those beds mean there are more people who need permanent housing than there is permanent housing available to them. That's how it's been everywhere I've lived. We don't know who those people are, where they are, what their issues are, sometimes even how to help them. They may as well be invisible to us. Things like that only get on our radar from time to time. I'm sure many of you 
we're, we'll remember back to 1981, uh, when Jane Byrne, who was the mayor of Chicago, moved into the Cabrini Green projects in Chicago to draw attention to how bad it was there. Uh, things got better, at least in that particular project. Uh, at least while Mayor Byrne lived there, but there were plenty of other projects in Chicago and elsewhere. No mayors moved in there. No one paid attention. Nothing got any better. Once she moved out, I don't remember, I should have looked up, I don't remember how long she stayed there, but it wasn't like for her whole term or anything like that. So I don't know if things went back to the way they had been after she moved out or not. I was about to say that things went back to normal. Normal isn't how that should be. Normal shouldn't be people having to live in that kind of a place and that kind of a fear and that kind of a squalor. None of this ever, none of this really even touches on people in situations that would never make the newspapers anyway. The only reason I ever knew the name Cabrini Green, because I did not live in Chicago at the time, was that I read it in the newspaper in Fort Wayne, where I did live. None of this deals with families that we know through school, through work. None of this deals with people that we may live next door to, but not really know much about. None of this deals with our own lives or our own households. There are issues like these all over our lives, some of them catastrophic, and some of them matters of quiet desperation. I just know that in my own life, it is easy to be distracted by the, the big story, the major outrage, the tragedy of the day. And if it's easy for me to be distracted, it's probably easy for other people too. And so the fact that there is a fact that I need to keep in mind and others need to keep it in mind too. It's a challenge for me to see invisible people. It's not a challenge for Jesus because Jesus doesn't do triage. Jesus deals with the needs that are there as he finds them the big needs, the small needs. People who are young and who are old, who are rich and who are poor. Troubles that, as the world views them, are important or trivial. Jesus deals with all of them. Jesus doesn't do triage. I hope that with God's guidance, God's power, we, can see the invisible people. We can see the invisible things in our own lives. We can deal with them as Jesus deals with them. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Go My Children. If you need the tune, it's number 433 in the hymnal. We'll sing verses one, three, and four. You're welcome to stand if you wish.
Go now with God and go in peace. Amen.